Oh, there's something in my chest that I can't hide When feelings get involved, I'm terrified Cause I've been here before and said goodbye Okay. Hello, everybody. Where are my captions? Oh, I have to actually start them. How about that? There we go. They were just a little delayed. Okay. Time to get into the next chapter of the Occult of History. And it's another long, long chapter, so I'm probably going to read um, only like half of it. I remember right. Let's see, it starts on 267. And it goes to... Past 300. Yeah, no. Ooh, 311, 313. Holy cow, 318. So, pretty long chapter. I think we're going to try for the halfway mark, um, which is going to be Oh, it's over 50 pages. Uh, we're going to go for the 25 page mark or thereabouts. Maybe we'll just go the through the pictures in the middle and call that a good an end. Yeah, that's the goal. We'll do the pictures in the middle in the middle of the chapter because it shows pictures of all the people we're going to be reading about. All right, here we go. Part 2, Chapter 5, Adepts and Imposters. 
After the great 16th century, there is a falling off in the quality of magic. The reason is anybody's guess. All things go in cycles. There are great ages of poetry, of painting, of music, of science. In the year Cornelius Agrippa was born, there appeared a book called The Hammer of Witches, Malleus Maleficarum, by two Dominicans, Jacob Sprenger, 1436 to 1495, and Heinrich Kramer, 1430 to 1505, which Russell, Russell Hope Robbins calls, quote, the most important and most sinister work on demonology ever written, end quote. The authors were respectively dean of Cologne University and prior of a monastery. The book went into 16 German editions, 11 French, 2 Italian, and at least 6 English. Dr. Faust, or Faust, who became such an interesting hero of a legend, lived at the beginning of the century, for Trithemius mentions him contemptuously in a letter written in 1507. Faust was to replace Theophilus in the public imagination, but there, but where Theophilus had been a poor creature who sold his soul to the devil in a fit of despair, Faust was a satanic hero, twitching his mustaches and committing mischievous villainies. Theophilus captured the imagination of six centuries because the idea of traffic with the devil was so terrifying. The 16th century found it rather piquant, piquant, whatever, however you want to pronounce that, I don't care, rather exciting. Faust aroused a kind of secret admiration. What was happening, as we can now see in retrospect, was that the church was losing its grip. The human imagination was growing up. The age of science was approaching. <clears throat> An intelligent, cultured country gentleman named Reginald Scott wrote The Dis Discovery of Witchcraft in the 1580s. He took the point of view of the thoroughgoing skeptic who declared that, quote, all spiritualistic manifestations were artful impostures, end quote, and that witches were an invention of the Inquisition. Some of his anecdotes are ribald and delightful, as, for example, the story of a young man who was unfortunate enough to lose his sexual member while fornicating. He went to a witch who told him she knew of a tree in which there was a nest full of spare penises, <laughs> quote, and being in the top of the tree, he took out a mighty great one and showed the same to her, asking her if he might have the same. Nay, quoth she, that is our parish priest's tool, but take any other thou wilt, <laughs> end quote. <laughs> the nest apparently contained twenty or thirty tools lying in povender, undoubtedly oats, upon which they fed. Uh, quote, these are no jests, Scott says seriously, for they be written by judges, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> King James I called the book damnable and wrote his demonology to refute it. But even with a king's name to recommend it, the book never achieved the popularity of Scott's work. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> hey, salty little dude, how you doing tonight? <laughs> Scott was mistaken in his belief that all spiritual spiritualistic manifestations are due to fraud or to mental disturbance on the part of the witnesses. But after so many centuries of total credulity, it was well, it was a healthy sign. As to King James, he had been converted to a belief in witches by the North Berwick case, in which a young girl who possessed natural gifts for quote unquote spiritual healing was tortured by her master until she confessed that she was aided by the devil. Under further torture, she implicated a number of other people. Those she named were so respectable a school teacher, John Fian, a cultured elderly lady, Agnes Sampson, two other women of sound repute, 
uh, Euphemia McLean and Barbara Napier, that it seems likely she chose them because she hoped they would quickly show the absurdity of the charges. But the only way to stop inhuman tortures was to invent tales of witches' sabbaths and implicate more innocent people. This they all did until 70 people stood trial. King James himself supervised some of the torture, especially when Agnes Sampson invented a wild story about sailing to sea in a sieve to try to wreck the king's ship. Most of the 70 were burned, some without the usual mercy of being strangled beforehand. James wrote his demonology as a consequence of this experience. It is an ironical twist that James's passion for interrogating witches finally led him to agree with Reginald Scott that it was mostly fraud and illusion. In the last years of his reign, witchcraft trials almost ceased. It may be said in extenuation of James I that he was a neurotic homosexual of weak character whose Scottish common sense finally triumphed over his superstitious credulity. The life of Dr. John Dee, one of the most sympathetic, if not remarkable, figures in the history of magic, spanned five reigns. Henry VIII, Edward VI, Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, and James I. Dee is almost unique among magicians in possessing absolutely no occult faculties. He said so repeatedly himself. He was a kind of mystic, although not of a particularly high order. For his obsession was knowledge, scholarship, learning. He was like some earlier H.G. Wells, consumed by a thirst to know everything. Like all true poets and magicians, he was driven by a vision of a reality quite different from the commonplace world in which we live out our lives. Paracelsus and Agrippa were doctors who studied magic because it was a part of their profession. Both had a streak of charlatanism. Dee studied magic because he was a poet, for whom it seemed to offer a key to another form of existence. There was nothing of the charlatan about him. Dee's father, a Welshman, was a minor official at the court of Henry VIII. Dee was born in London in July on July 13, 1527. Cornelius Agrippa was an embittered wanderer around Europe at the time. Paracelsus was about to be driven out of Basel by his enemies. Nostradamus was a young doctor without a degree who also traveled through Europe, fighting the plague. In due course, Dee himself would become something of a wanderer, although never homeless. Dee attended the Chantry School at Chelmsford. It, it was a peaceful little market town surrounded by green meadows with a brown, slow-moving river. Dee loved browsing through books and manuscripts. He was charmed by the Catholic ritual, for England was by no means all Protestant, and his appetite for knowledge was kept sharp by the narrowness of the school curriculum. At that time, and for another century, even the universities were thoroughly unambitious. Instead of reading, writing, and arithmetic, they taught grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Latin was taught, but hardly any Greek. Students were in the charge of a tutor who was so much in loco parentis that he could beat them if necessary. Academic standards were low in England. There was little to prevent a student spending his seven years drinking and womanizing. After all, no English gentleman could really find much use for Latin and logic, or even geography and mathematics when he took over the family estates. So when Dee went to St. John's College, Cambridge, at the age of 15, he had no reason to feel that he had found his spiritual home as Bertrand Russell did in the 1890s, but at least the opportunities were there if he wanted them. He did intensely. He allowed himself only four hours a night for sleep. He even studied Greek. The university authorities soon became aware that they had a prodigy among them, and at the age of 19, Dee was made a fellow of Trinity and an under-reader, assistant professor, in Greek. He was already an enthusiastic astronomer. The atmosphere of Cambridge stifled him. At the first opportunity, he went to the University of Louvain, one of the best in Europe, where Cornelius Agrippa had been. 
inevitably d read agrippa's occult philosophy and was excited and impressed by the notion that magic and alchemy were not merely diabolic studies but a practical aid in the mystical quest for god magic was in bad repute in england a suburban backwater as far as culture was concerned but on the continent it aroused intelligent interest it must be remembered that magic and science were closely linked at that time even mathematics was regarded as a magical study with pythagoras as his prophet magic meant for d what science meant for h g wells three centuries later it was what he had always dreamed of a magnificent wide field of study with no visible limits he quickly gained a reputation to match cornelius agrippa's when he went to paris in 1550 his reputation preceded him and at rheims he gave a course of lectures on euclid that were free for anyone to attend he was so popular that he was offered a professorship but he felt that more exciting things awaited him and returned to england where the ten-year-old edward the sixth had succeeded henry the eighth he was granted a pension by the king and immediately sold it for two rectorships I'm not sure what a rectorship is, to be honest. Um, in 1552, he met the occultist Jerome Card Cardan, who was a witch, quote-unquote, in the precise sense of the word. That is, he possessed a high degree of second sight and other occult faculties. There seems to be no reason to suspect Cardan of lying when he declares in his memoirs that he could project his spirit outside his body. He also makes the interesting assertion that he could, from childhood on, see imaginary things with a sense of total reality. As a child, he says, he could not control this faculty, but later he learned how to select things he wanted to see. All this conforms to the thick picture we have already built up of the natural visionary, a man with some kind of chemical imbalance that has the effect of a dose of a psychedelic drug on his nervous system. All this was accompanied by a semi-hysterical lack of self-control, so that he would argue for the sake of arguing, whether he believed what he said or not, and find himself compelled to speak of things that he knew would offend people. He believes himself to be accompanied by a familiar spirit, and was an unusually talented astrologer and prophet. He certainly qualifies as one of the most remarkable psychological curiosities of all time. Cardan was a major influence on D., he began to think in terms of spirits who might be co contacted to aid him with his researches. His problem now, and for the rest of his life, was money. He was convinced that if he could try his own approach to alchemy, the use of spirit forces, he, could, he would soon solve the problem of the Philosopher's Stone. But alchemy cost money. His hopes of royal preferment were dashed when Edward VI died at the age of 16, and the country was plunged into political crisis. Edward named Lady Jane Grey as his successor to the throne, and Dee's patron, the Earl of Northumberland, proclaimed her queen. She was the granddaughter of Henry VII, Henry VIII's eldest daughter. Mary had other ideas, and Northumberland and Lady Jane Grey lost their heads. The following year, Sir Thomas Wyatt, son of the poet, led a rebellion to protest against Queen Mary's proposed marriage to Philip of Spain. He wanted to put her younger sister Elizabeth on the throne instead. He also failed and was executed, and Elizabeth was placed under arrest. Having married the heir to the Spanish throne, Mary earned herself the nickname of Bloody Mary by burning large numbers of Protestants. As far as D was concerned, the only thing that could be said in favor of all this burning was that while people thought about burning Protestants, they forgot about burning witches. He was called upon to cast Mary's, Queen Mary's horoscope. Perhaps his foreknowledge of her early death gave him the idea of contacting her younger sister, who would be the next queen, and who was then a captive at Woodstock. He visited Elizabeth and cast her horoscope too. He also showed her the horoscope of her elder sister, for after all, was not Mary's fate entangled with Elizabeth's? But Mary's spies took the view that this was a little too like political plotting. Dee was arrested and thrown into jail, charged with treason. 
he had the upsetting experience of seeing a fellow prisoner, Bartlett Green, burned for heresy, although he seemed a harmless, gentle soul. It was lucky for Dee that Mary was fond of her younger sister, otherwise he might have paid the penalty of coming between the present and future queens. Dee was released in 1555, but it had been a near thing. Mary died three years later, and Elizabeth became queen. The first thing she did was to ask Dee to calculate the most favorable day for the coronation, and Dee suggested January 14, 1559. Now it looked as if Dee was firmly established at, at last. He was more or less the royal astrologer. It was unfortunate that Queen Elizabeth I was tight-fisted, and Dee's finances failed to improve. He became a kind of general errand boy, traveling to the continent on missions for the Queen, and for her minister, Burley and Sir Francis Walsingham, head of the Queen's spy system. Like Agrippa, Dee D found himself hurled into intrigue. For a bookish, peace-loving scholar, it must have been a considerable strain. In Amsterdam in 1563, he discovered a book called Stenographia by Trithemius, a work on magic, alchemy, and the meaning of numbers. It influenced Dee's own work on magic, Monus Hieroglyphica, which he finished in 12 days after reading Trithemius. Commentators have been puzzled by the remark of Lord Burleigh, the Secretary of State, that it was, quote, of the utmost importance for the security of the realm, end quote. Why? It, see, it deals in ciphers, which might have been valuable in spying, and Dee was already obsessed with the idea of discovering buried treasure by means of the spirits, which would certainly have benefited the realm. The, other, the only other possibility is that Dee thought he, was a, he had a certain method of forestalling the plans of England's enemies through astrology. If so, no one believed in it enough to finance it. D remained the errand boy and occasional consultant on magical affairs. After various continental working wanderings, D returned to England in 1564 and moved to his mother's house at the Thames Thameside village of Mortlake, where he returned to his magical studies. In 1574, when he was 47, he married, but his wife died a year later. That he was still in royal favor is shown by the fact that the queen paid an informal call on the day of his wife's death. She wanted to see his magic glass, which seemed to have been nothing but a convex mirror. When she heard there was death in the house, she refused to come in, but examined the glass in a nearby field. Two years later, Dee married Jane Fromond, lady-in-waiting to Lady Howard of Effingham, some, some years his junior. They settled in his mother's house at Mortlake, and she soon produced the first of the eight children she would bear him. When his mother died in 1580, she had already given him the house. For a few years, Dee's life was idyllic. He cast horoscopes to eke out his income. He made maps of the queen had a great deal to do with plans for naval defense, so that he must be given some of the credit for the defeat of the Armada in 1588, and made calculations for a new calendar. His interest in occult matters never slackened, and in his spiritual diary, he becomes he, rec he records dreams and tales of spirit wrappings and other manifestations. But his new obsession was crystal gazing, the idea that long gazing into any kind of clear depth can induce a semi-trance-like -trans state in which the future future bleh, sorry in which the future can be foreseen and spirits reveal themselves d's chief trouble was that his mind was too discursive and active for the kind of serene contemplation necessary what he needed was someone with occult faculties a scryer or descrier in 1581, Dee had a brief experience of seeing something in the crystal, but he does not specify what it was. In 1582, he found a youth named Barnabas Saul, who became his scryer for a few months. However, Barnabas got into trouble with the law, for reasons that are not recorded, and was questioned about his occult activities. 
He preferred to denounce D rather than face the prospect of further entanglement with the law, which had stringent statutes against, statutes against witchcraft. So D lost his natural seer. Two days later, D was visited by a swarthy, good-looking young Irishman named Edward Kelly, who talked about occult matters and mentioned that he was a natural scryer. There is no reason to disbelieve, disbelieve him, although he seems to have been an objectionable young man in many ways. He was an apothecary's apprentice, turned forger and coiner, for which he had lost his ears. Oh, that I never knew about Edward Kelly. Interesting. Occult faculties often seem to be accompanied by instability of character. D explained that he was not a magician, since the word magic held evil associations for him. Before his sessions of crystal gazing, he always prayed for divine help. Kelly agreed. He fell on his knees and prayed solemnly. Then he peered into the crystal. In less than a quarter of an hour, he was describing to D the figure of a cherub that he could see in its depths. D instantly identified it from his Kabbalistic knowledge as Uriel, the angel of light. The angel could not communicate, being imprisoned in the crystal, so to speak. But D felt this was the beginning of a new epoch in his life. The philosopher's stone was already within reach. He immediately invited Kelly to move into the house. D's wife, on being introduced to the earless, earless Irishman, was less enthusiastic. She had an intuition that things would not go well, and she never took to Kelly thereafter. But as an obedient wife, she accepted him. Not, all, not long afterwards, Kelly decided to marry a local girl, for now that his wanderings were temporarily at an end, he experienced the need for someone to share his bed. The evidence seems to show that he always had a secret hankering after Jane D., who was closer to his own age than to her husband's, but she regarded him with mistrust. It is a pity that there is no detailed record of what happened in the D household after Kelly's arrival in 1582. Oh, sorry, I just just now looked back at the screen. You said good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm really enjoying this book, so it's easy to get into it and lose track of chat. <laughs> Plus, I have to look over the top of these stupid cheaters to be able to read it. It's a pity that there is no detailed record of what happened in the D household after Kelly's arrival in 1582. All we know is that Kelly, is, in spite of a touch of charlatanism, possessed the Irish gift of second sight, and that very soon he was seeing and hearing spirits every day. Since he could hear them now, it must be assumed that they spoke in audible voices. Reading Dee's own account, in the light of our more detailed knowledge of such things, it is almost certain that Kelly went into a light trance and contacted spirits like any modern medium. The <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. <sighs> Excuse me. Um, there were various guides. One was called Medicina. These these guides brought along other spirits. D, with no experience to guide him in these matters, assumed that all were angels. One woman asked D if he thought she was a jeweler's wife because she wore jewelry. D replied that he was certain she was a messenger of Jesus because Jesus had purchased the jewel of eternal the quote the jewel of eternal life with the jewel of his precious blood end quote. The spirits must have found him a tiresome old crank. However, like most of the spirits who appear at modern seances, they seem to have nothing very profound or useful to impart. After many months, Dee was as far as ever from the Philosopher's Stone or the secret of divining buried treasure, and Kelly found the quiet, scholarly household a strain after his adventurous life, and was subject to fits of violent rage which the gentle Dee put up with. Kelly also complained that the spirits addressed him in foreign languages. He sneaked off whenever he could on the pretext of seeking treasure, and no doubt found the brothels and alehouses of London more congenial than the Mortlake House. 
The spirits knew what he was up to and often denounced him, in his presence, of course, to Dr. D, calling him a youngling but old sinner, and telling D that his own sight was perfecter than Kelly's because purer. In November 1582, D had a vision of a child angel floating outside the window holding a crystal egg. He identified this with Uriel. Then the, arch the archangel Michael appeared and told D not to be afraid of it, but to pick it up. Since this crystal ball is now in the cr British Museum, there is presumably something behind the story, although I know of no precedent in occult history for spirits actually making gifts of spiritual objects. In 1583, a Polish nobleman, Count Adalbert Lasky, was introduced to Dee. He was a servant of Henry III of France, whom, he, whom we have already met in connection with Nostradamus, and he wanted Dee to foretell the king's future. He also thought Dee might give him advice through the spirits about his own claim to the Polish crown. Vacated by Henry of Anjou, when he became Henry III of France. Lasky became such a regular visitor at Dee's house that Dee, who was always in debt, had to apply to the Queen for money to entertain him. Lasky was so impressed by Dee and Kelly that he urged them to accompany him to Prague to visit the King of Germany, the occult student Rudolf II. Dee disliked the idea, but Kelly cheered up at the pros prospect of travel and even stopped having tantrums for a while. In 1585, Dee and Kelly, accompanied by their wives and Dee's three children, set out on a continental journey which was to last four years. Wow. On the whole, it was a frustrating four years. Kelly was getting about above himself. He had picked up magical jargon from Dee and was now inclined to represent himself as the master. He claimed to be the owner of a rare alchemical manuscript and a powder of projection, i.e. a powder for changing base metals to gold, which he had found at Glastonbury, the legendary home of Merlin and King Arthur. They t continued to converse with spirits and see visions, and Jane Dee produced more babies. Dee was kindly received by the great King Stephen Bathory of Poland at Krakow, but ordered out of Prague by King Rudolf, who explained that the Pope had accused him of necromancy. Count Wilhelm Rosenberg, Viceroy of Bohemia, invited them to his castle at Tra Trabau, and there, and there D spent a peaceful 18 months, although Kelly again being quarrelsome, became quarrelsome. When Kelly decided that he had had enough of de de descrying spirits in the crystal, Dee tried his eight-year-old son, Arthur, but the boy saw nothing. Kelly agreed to try again, and this time had an amazing message. The guide, Medimi, had ordered him and Dee to share their wives in common. Jane Dee had hysterics, then became furious. When the child angel, Uriel, confirmed the counsel, Dee added his persuasions and wrote, quote, there is no other remedy, but as hath been said of our cross-matching, so it must needs be done. She showed herself prettily resolved to be content for God his sake and his secret purpose, purposes to obey the admonishment, end quote. This sounds clear enough, although Dee's biographers all seem intent on preserving decency by insisting that the scandalous episode never took place, or at least never reached the carnal stage. Kelly now decided that nothing further was to be got by prolonging the partnership, and he and Dee finally separated. Dee returned to England. Kelly re achieved some success as an alchemist and scryer, but seemed to have died in prison not many years later. Dee returned to England in 1589 and was to live until 1608, to the age of 81, but the remaining years of his life were, on the whole, disappointing. In his absence, his house had been broken into and many of his books and instruments destroyed. The Queen finally granted him the wardenship of Christ College at Manchester, then little more, then little more than a village, but he found it a frustrating post and altogether less 
of a sinecure than he had hoped. His wife died of the plague there. He continued to write. His unpublished writing would occupy many volumes and wrote about his dreams in his diary. When the queen died in 1603, Dee knew that his hopes of further preferment were at an end. James I had no use for a reputed sorcerer. The best he could hope for was to be left in peace. His new, new scryer, Bartholomew Hickman, had visions of the angel Raphael who uttered comforting messages and foretold that Dee would finally discover the secrets he had spent his life searching for. But the vision was probably inspired by Dee's own wishful thinking, for he died at Mortlake in 1608, still no nearer to the object of his life's quest. As his biographer G.M. Hort remarks, he cannot claim to rank among the world's successes. His main significance is that he was one of the first great occultists to make constant use of spirit communication. He was the founder of a modern psychical research, founder of modern psychical research, 200 years before his time. All right, moving on. That was around the end of D, I suppose. Okay. In 1600, the age of magic was over. The voice of sane skepticism was making itself heard. In Rebelli, Rebel, Rebelli in Montaigne, in Ben Johnson. Montaigne was re revolted by the burning of witches and remarked, quote, a brilliant and sharp clarity is needed to be able to kill people. Our life is too real and substantial for supernatural fantastic incidents, end quote. No one, I think, not even an occultist, would, agree, would disagree with him. The problem here is simply what human consciousness is aware of. William James, in The Ver Varieties of Religious Experience, contrasts the quote-unquote sick soul, who is always too aware of the misery and suffering in the world, and the clear-eyed optimist whose temperament rejects misery instinctively. The same thing ha applies to matters of the occult. A busy, energetic sort of person has no time for the supernatural, and his temperamental rejection of it makes him feel that his world of practical, clear-cut issues is the only real one. It is a healthy instinct. We should bear in mind that nearly all children dislike the supernatural, except in ghost stories. This is not necessarily fear, but an instinctive need to confront a clear, simple world in which they can make decisions and shape their lives. Anyone who has ever learned to love science can understand this. There is something cold, hard, and exhilarating about science, like a snowball fight on a frosty day. It seems to open up vistas of control and conquest. By comparison, the world of the occult is misty and damp, reminding man of his ignorance and encouraging him to adopt a passive attitude towards his existence. With the age of Rebe Rebele and Shakespeare, then of Newton and Milton, the human intel intellect reached a new stage in its evolution. There was a sense of potentialities of exciting, of exciting horizons. The discovery of America in 1492 was a symbol of this change. The Roman church was tottering under the blows dealt it by Luther and Henry VIII. It is true that Galileo was forced to recant the view he expressed in 1632, that the earth went round the sun, but in the year, year of his death, 1642, Newton was born, and it no longer mattered greatly what the Pope and his cardinals said. With the publication of the Prince, Principia in 1687, science had taken a greater step forward than magic had taken since its birth in, in ancient Egypt and Chaldea. When one considers the involved absurdities of Cornelius Agrippa, John Dee, and Trithemius, then turns to this magnificent, complex structure of ideas in which everything is true, it becomes possible to see why magic had ceased to be important. 
The truth is that the rise of science was in no way a blow against occultism. On the contrary, it meant that occultism could free itself from the pseudoscience of Agrippa and Paracelsus and concentrate upon its real concerns. The greatest occultist of the 18th century, although he belongs to the history of religion rather than magic, was born in the year after Newton published the Principia. Emmanuel, Emmanuel Swedenborg was a natural medium, although his powers developed late in life. In his early years, he studied science and mathematics. At 28, he became assessor of the Swedish Board of Mines and wrote a work on the smelting of metals. He studied astronomy and physiology, but he was an intensely frustrated man. Soon after he became an assessor, he fell in love with a Miss Pelham, and was accepted by her, but she decided she did not care for Swedenborg after all, and broke off the engagement. Swedenborg was highly sexed, and it must have been a blow on every level, of pride, of emotion, and of purely masculine, masculine sexuality. In his book on conjugal love, he shocked his followers by stating that concubinage and the keeping of mistresses are excusable under certain circumstances, a remarkable statement for the son of a bishop. Yeah. At least <clears throat> a public statement, anyway. He was equally frustrated intellectually for his scientific views, many of which were far ahead of his time, were ignored... <clears throat> Damn it, were ignored by Sweden's academies. He escaped his frustrations through hard work. In 1713, at about the time of his disappointment in love, Charles XII asked him to solve the problem of transporting five ships across 15 miles of dry land. He was besieging the Danes in the fortress of Fredrikshald. Swedenborg did it in seven weeks. He was later involved in building the docks at Karlskrona and in building the canal that was to connect the North Sea to the Baltic and which had to be abandoned when Charles XII was killed in battle. Swedenborg's energy was enormous. He wrote books on algebra, astronomy, minerals, economics, the tides, salt mining, and on anatomy. All this practical work starved the religious side of his nature, and in 1744 this burst out like a torrent. He began with a dream in which he heard a roaring wind that seemed to pick him up and fling him on, it, on his face. He began to pray and then saw Jesus in front of him. After a cryptic conversation which ended with Jesus saying, quote, quote, Well then, so, end quote, he woke up. This was only one of a series of strange dreams and hallucinations or visions. He began having ecstatic trances and the perpetual sexual itch suddenly ceased it to trouble him. There followed visions in which he paid visits to heaven and hell. He announced in his books that the afterworld is very much like this one in all basic particulars and that People remain much as they were when they were alive, but since it is less substantial than this world, their states of mind are far more important, and heaven and hell are these states of mind. In such works as The True Christian Religion, Heaven and Hell, The Divine Lore, and Wisdom, he describes circumstantially conversations with angels, devils, and people who have passed over. And this leads us to the heart of the Swedenborg problem. Most of his contemporaries dismissed him as a madman or a liar, <clears throat> and his 20th century critics, e.g. Dingwall, for example, have been inclined to take a Freudian view and to regard his visions as eruption of his repressed sexuality. There is a good case for this view. In 1748, when he was 60, he woke up believing that his hair was full of small snakes and attributed this to the departed spirit of certain Quakers. His view of the Quakers suggests a definite touch of paranoia. Against all the evidence, he deserted, repeated, he asserted repeatedly that their worship was vile and indecent and that, that they practiced wife-swapping. 
This seems to indicate a capacity for self-delusion and a sexual obsession. On the other hand, when one turns to his writings, it becomes difficult to make this reductionist view. His obsession with biblical exegist may bore may bore the modern reader, and as far as style goes, he is certainly not Pascal or Newman. But it is all sane and lucid enough, refreshingly so. There are no flashes of genius in his work, but there is a balanced and deeply serious mind. When challenged by skeptics about his views, he remained calm and serious, never losing his temper or even his sense of humor. And although these views seemed wild and strange to his own contemporaries, they have received a great deal of support since then. Spiritualism did not exist in the 18th century. It came into existence in the 1850s. By the end of the 19th century, there was a considerable body of literature that purported to have been dictated by spirits, such as the spirit teachings of Stanton Moses. And these have continued to swell ever since. The general tone of much of this literature is nauseatingly uh, pietistic. But it must be admitted that it was a remarkable inner has a remarkable inner consistency. When one considers how easily religious sects develop their own doctrines and dogma, this agreement is surprising. Its descriptions of the other world correspond closely to Swedenborg's. Skeptics may take the view that this is because Swedenborg influenced the spiritualists. Spiritualists deny this on the ground that the sheer variety and quantity of spirit writings in many languages and written over a century disproves it. The only other logical ex explanation is the Jungian one, that Swedenborg's visions were ex explorations of the racial psyche, expressions of archetypal symbols, and that the tr same is true of modern spiritualism. Without taking sides, we can only point out that the evidence in Swedenborg's favor is stronger today than it was in his own time. On the other hand, <clears throat> what, can, what can one say about his book, Earths in the Universe, in which he states that most of the planets have inhabitants, and then goes on to describe them in a way that suggests a painting by Hieronymus Bosch. The atmosphere of the moon is different from that of the Earth, so that, so that moon men speak from their stomachs instead of their lungs, with an effect like belching. The Martians have faces that are half black and half tawny. They live on fruit and dress in fibers made from tree bark. If Swedenborg was a medium, we can only assume the spirits were pulling his leg. Or, what is more likely, his imagination was so highly developed that he mixed up his dreams and fantasies with his authentic insights. How much farther do we have to go to get to those pictures? Holy crap. Okay. Ten more pages. All right. It is what it is. The Freudian or reductionist explanation cannot be entirely dismissed. Swedenborg was sexually frustrated. Was sexually frustrated. Some of his religious experiences can be paralleled in any textbook of abnormal psychology. He was in his late 50s when his explosive psychological forces finally achieved a certain balance. But this recognition could not blind us, should not blind us, to his genuine religious inspiration and the importance of his basic ideas. There was nothing, nothing of the charlatan about him, and his life does not show the parabolic rise and fall that seems characteristic of magicians. Of the genuineness of his occult powers, there can be little doubt. Count Hopkin, one of his contemporaries, tells the best known of these. Quote, Swedenborg was one day at a court reception. Her Majesty asked him about different things in the other life, and lastly, whether he had seen or talked with her brother, the Prince Royal of Prussia. He answered no. Her Majesty then requested him to ask after him, and gave him her greeting, and give him her greeting, which Swedenborg promised to do. I doubt whether the Queen meant this seriously. At the next reception, Swedenborg again appeared at court, and while the Queen was 
surrounded by her ladies of honor, he came boldly forward and approached her majesty. Swedenborg not only greeted her from her brother, but also gave her his apologies for not having answered her last letter. He also wished to do so now through Swedenborg, which he accordingly did. The queen was greatly overcome and said, No one but God knows this secret. End quote. On July 19, 1759, a great fire took place in Stockholm. Swedenborg was 300 miles away at the time, in Gothenburg, a guest at a party. At six in the evening, he told the guests that the fire had just broken out. Two hours later, he told them that it had been extinguished only three doors from his home. This was confirmed two days later when a messenger arrived from Stockholm, verifying every detail of Swedenborg's description. In 1761, Mademoiselle de Mar Marteville, or is it Madame, M-M-E, anyway, de Marteville, oh, Madame, I should have read further, Madame de Marteville, the widow of the Dutch ambassador, asked Swedenborg for his help. A silversmith was demanding payment for a silver tea service, and she was certain her husband had paid for it before his death. However, she could not find the receipt. She asked Swedenborg if he could contact her husband. Swedenborg said he would try. A few days later, he told Madame de Mardeville that he had spoken to her husband, who said that the tea service had been paid for seven months before his death, and that the receipt would be found in the bureau drawer. Madame de Mardeville replied that the bureau in question had been thoroughly searched. Swedenborg then described a secret compartment in the bureau that contained some private correspondence and the receipt. Both receipt and correspondence were found where Swedenborg had described them. E.G. Dingwall, in a penetrating article on Swedenborg, points out that the evidence for these three incidents and for certain others of a similar nature is confused and conflicting. This may well be so, but unless we intend to dismiss all these stories as fabrications or at least exaggerations, there is no point in dwelling on minor differences between versions written by different witnesses at different times. There have been many other mediums who have performed similar marvels. If the basic pro proposition of this book is correct, that the occult faculty is latent in everyone and can be developed by anyone who really wants to, then it is likely enough that the three stories are fraudulent, fra fundamentally accurate. I don't know where I got fraudulent. Uh, Swedenberg had the first important qualification for acquiring second sight and or mediumship, lack of self-division, a wholehearted obsession with things spiritual. But like any other medium, Swedenborg was far from infallible, as his curious words about the Quakers demonstrate. When Swedenborg was asked by a friend if he could foretell the future, he replied, replied flatly that only God knew the future. If he meant this as a general proposition and not merely as a denial of his own powers, then he was again mistaken. The evidence for prevision is as abundant as for other forms of mediumship. Dingwall points out that another visionary named Humphrey Smith prophesied the fire of London six years before it happened. So, for that matter, did the astrologer William Lilly, who was actually summoned before a committee investigating the Great Fire on suspicion of knowing more about it than he should because he had foreseen both the fire and the plague and published his prediction the previous year. The real importance of Swedenborg's lies in the Swedenborg lies in the doctrines he taught, which are the reverse of the gloom and hellfire of other breakaway sects. He rejects the notion that Jesus died on the cross to atone for the sin of Adam, declaring that God is neither vindictive nor petty-minded, and that since he is God, he doesn't need atonement. It is remarkable that this common-sense view had never struck earlier theologians. God is divine goodness, and Jesus is divine wisdom, and goodness has to be approached through wisdom. Whatever one thinks about the extraordinary claims of its founder, it must be acknowledged that there is something very beautiful and healthy about the Swedenborgian religion. This feeling of breezy health 
is the basic reason for its enduring popularity. Its founder may not have been a great occultist, but he was a great man. I have been really interested in reading some Swedenborg. I might just have to move him up the list. But I've already picked out the next book. Um, I got it as a gift, and I will be announcing it uh, probably in a couple weeks. <laughs> it's going to be a while. Um, the new spirit of science meant, in effect, that a Paracelsus or John Dee could no longer exist. If Paracelsus had been born two centuries later, he would have been an eminent doctor and scientist, not a magician. As to the occultists themselves, they could no longer claim that science was on their side, which meant, in effect, that they had to lay claim to extra-scientific knowledge. They had a choice. Charlatanism? charlatanism or mysticism, and from the year 1700 onward, there is no magician who lacks a streak of charlatanism. This certainly applies to one of the most interesting transitional figures, Franz Anton Mesmer. Oh, Mesmer, yeah. Uh, who is falsely credited with having invented hypnotism, which, with which mesmerism has become synonymous. He is one of the most curious stories in the history of occultism. Mesmer's life should have been comfortable and uneventful. His parents were well off. He was born in Switzerland on May 23, 1734, and took a degree at the University of Vienna at the age of 32. The subject of his dissertation seems to throw back to the age of Paracelsus, the influence of planets on the human body. Written, of course, in Latin. He was a man of compelling personality, a rich patient, some years his senior fell in love with him and he married her and moved into her fine palace on the outskirts of Vienna. He also owned a luxurious townhouse at 261 Ladstrasse. The theory advanced by Mesmer in his thesis is of considerable interest. He believed in a kind of psychic ether that pervades all space and that the heavenly bodies cause tides in this fluid. These ever-moving tides produce health. If something checks their action in individuals, the result is sickness. In other words, health is man's natural condition. Sickness is a kind of blockage. Man must rely on instinct rather than reason, an instinctive oneness with nature. If a blockage has occurred in a patient, the best way to cure it is to bring on a crisis which will sweep it away. These theories interested a Jesuit named Professor Maximilian Hell. H e h l. He had been he had been consulted by a wealthy English lady who was passing through Vienna in 1774, because she had stomach cramps and believed that a magnet could cure them. She had left hers at home. Hale made her the magnet, which she laid on her stomach. Her cramps vanished. Was it possible that the magnet was moving Mesmer's etheric fluid around the body? He made this suggestion to Mesmer, who began trying the effect of magnets on his patients. Amazingly, they seemed to work, so the body did possess tides. And now we know they actually do use magnets now. It's an alternative medicine, but it's still, it, people swear by it. Uh, not long afterwards, Mesmer was bleeding a patient... In those days, it was the common cure for most ailments. He observed that the flow of blood increased when he approached and lessened when he moved away. The conclusion was clear. His own body must be a kind of magnet. Man possesses animal magnetism. In 1775, Mesmer published a pamphlet about his discoveries. The, ma the medical profession was skeptical, but patients were anxious to try the new treatment, and Mesmer's practice increased. He would lay magnets on the patients, or simply his hands, and the pains would vanish. What happened is clear enough. Mesmer believed that the magnets and his hands moved the stagnating magnetic fluid in his sick patients. His patients also believed it. So when they felt relief, Mesmer had reason to believe that he had produced it. And like Colonel Alcott, who began to develop healing gifts, the latent healing gifts that every human being or 
he began to develop healing gifts, the latent healing gifts that every human being possesses. Mesmer's fame increased suddenly through an accident. A hypochondriac baron, Hareski de Horka, uh, suffered from spasms that doctors were unable to cure. Finally, one tired and sarcastic doctor told him that he should try Mesmer, meaning, no doubt, to in intimate that since the baron's troubles were imaginary, a quack could do them no harm. Mesmer went to the baron's estate at Rokau. He had slipped several large magnets between his clothes to recharge himself, for he believed that animal magnetism and the metallic kind are one and the same. For several days, the baron failed to respond to treatment, and the spasms continued. Mesmer, certain of his powers, persisted, and on the sixth day, the results began. As the baron rift in asthmatic paroxysms, Mesmer held the baron's foot. The paroxysms abated. He held his hand. They started again. Clearly, Mesmer had finally got the measure of the baron's etheric fluids and was learning to make them flow back and forth as he wanted. After an hour of this, the baron felt fine. The cure became the gossip of Vienna, and the medical profession cursed their sarcastic colleague who had helped establish a charlatan. Mesmer devised an apparatus to distribute the magnetism. A number of jars of magnetized water with magnets immersed in it were connected with steel bands, and the whole arrangement placed in a wooden tub half full of iron filings and water. A metal nozzle could be used to spray the magnetic power around the room. Trees in the garden were magnetized. So was the fountain. Patients lay around in the garden by the dozens, holding hands and receiving the waves of magnetic power. The results continued to be remarkable. Oh, hey, Nambro. How's it going? Speaking of atonement, happy Yom Kippur. Be cleansed all in chat. <laughs> Why, thank you. Mesmer's downfall in Vienna came through a young blind pianist named Maria Theresia Paradis, a protege of the Empress. Mesmer, unaware that her blindness was purely physical in origin due to a detached retina, offered to cure her if she could come and live in his house. The Empress gave permission. The girl was naturally enthusiastic, and after a few weeks she became convinced that she could see dimly. All Vienna discussed the case, but there were doubters who pointed out that when Mesmer treated women patients, they dressed in a loose smock, and his hands carefully kneaded their breasts and thighs. Why were his resident patients all pretty girls? Why did he neglect his ailing and elderly wife? A professor, Barth, was appointed to examine Maria Paradis, and he had pronounced emphatically that she was still blind. The girl's father was influenced by Barth and the Jesuit hell. Now, on, now an enemy of Mesmer's, to go and drag her away from the house of sin. The girl refused to go, even when her mother slapped her into a state of exhaustion. Finally, the imperial morality police intervened, and Mesmer decided to flee Vienna before he was arrested. The girl returned to her parents. It is said that Mesmer had, in fact, helped improve her condition, and that Barth admitted this privately to Mesmer. However, the blindness certainly returned when the treatment was discontinued. Mesmer went to Paris and immediately became a craze. A century before Freud, he had discovered the importance of the sexual element in hysterical illnesses. He would enter his treatment room in a lilac silk dressing gown, carrying a long magnet, which he would point at patients as he passed. He would go into the next room and begin to play a magnetized piano. The patients would form a chain, men alternating with women, and press their thighs to increase the magnetism. Soon, people would have convulsions and collapse on the floor. Since magnetism was performed with hands and the thighs were a sensitive area, they had 
every opportunity of trying out their animal magnetism on one another, all in the cause of medical science. Assistance would take away some of the more violently affected to the crisis room where further animal magnetism was applied to bring on a climactic con convulsion. Everyone believed totally in Mesmer's theories, for only ardent belief could justify these orgiastic activities. It was a delightful way of losing repressions, and the treatment was unmistak unmistakably successful. Mesmer's fame spread throughout France. He instructed pupils in his methods and established centers in many major cities. When conflict with the authorities began, it was Mesmer who was in the strong position. The king, Louis the Sixteenth offered Mesmer a pension for life if he would promise to remain in France, but pointed out that he ought to allow a medical commission to examine proofs of his claims before a contact, contract was signed. Mesmer declined to furnish proofs and refused to sign a contract. He asked for a guaranteed half million francs for research and threatened to leave France if it was not provided without strings attached. His, his aristocratic patience begged the king to give way, but Louis dug in his heels. On the day of his ultimate, on the day his, on the day his ultimatum fell due, Mesmer left France. This was a sep, on September 18, 1780. His followers immediately started a fund, each contributing a hundred Louis d'Or, d'Or for the privilege of being a shareholder in a new magnetic company. When the fund reached 350,000 Louis d'Or, far more than he had demanded, Mesmer agreed to re return to France, and his activities continued as triumphantly as ever. It's D apostrophe O-R, so d'Or, I don't know. My French is non-existent these days. The king was understandably irritated by this behavior and finally succumbed to the demands of his medical college to set up an independent commission of inquiry. In 1784, several doctors observed the, with fascination the violent convulsions of the patients and concluded that although Mesmer certainly possessed strong powers of suggestion, there was no evidence of a magnetic fluid. For Mesmer, this was the end of the boom. His fortunes declined gently. He was satirized and jeered at. A doctor went to him with a fake story of illness, allowed Mesmer, Mesmer to cure him, then published an account of it, of it all, claiming that it revealed Mesmer's inability to diagnose illness. Since the tide was against Mesmer, no one pointed out that most doctors could be taken in by the same methods. A concert given by Maria Paradis did nothing to improve the situation. She was as blind as ever. Mesmer had the courage to attend and to ignore the whispers and comments of the audience who all knew the story. He stayed in Paris throughout the revolution, but finally felt that his life was in danger and fled. He lost all his money. An attempt to set up practice in Vienna was foiled again by the police, who promptly banished him over the border. He was nearly 60, he was tired, and the attacks had lowered the self-confidence that was the basis of his, his type of healing. He managed to live comfortably. A man with such a reputation could never lack for wealthy patients, and finally retired near Constance. He declined an offer from the King of Prussia to set up a Mesmer Institute in Berlin, whereupon the King sent a doctor to learn his secret, and the doctor was appointed prof professor of mesmerism at the Berlin Academy and placed in charge of a hospital devoted to its methods. His last years were peaceful and he died in 1815, just before his 79th birthday. It may be felt that he was of no significance in the history of occultism, but this is not true. In a in important respects, he might almost be a reincarnation of Paracelsus. He recognized the importance of the spirit, the imagination, and felt that the universe is pervaded by meaningfulness, meaningful influences. Sorry. 
Most of his results can be explained in terms of hysteria, release of repression, autosuggestion, and so on. But what is important is that he understood the illness is not natural, but some kind of blockage of natural forces, a kind of mental stagnation. His instinctive desire was to set the vital forces in motion again. If the treatment had been entirely a matter of imagination, it would not have worked as well as it did. He did not understand the forces he was using, but he recognized their existence. The discovery that he should have, should have made, and is generally credited with having made, was stumbled upon by one of his disciples, the Marquis of Pusigur, who was one day trying to magnetize a shepherd boy by stroking his head when he observed that the young man had fallen asleep. Shaken, the boy remained ins insensible. The Marquis shouted, Stand up! And to his surprise, the boy stood up without opening his eyes. When asked questions, he replied, When told to walk or sit down, he did so. Finally, when he woke up, he had no memory of what had happened. Pusigur called the phenomenon spasmodic sleep, and it, 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 it was for an Englishman James Braid to call it hypnotism in 1843. Braid realized that hypnotism is basically due to a narrowing of the attention until the mind is in a state of what he called monoideism, single ideaism. That is to say, the hypnotic trance is the reverse of what I have called faculty X. It, it follows the se that since we are so seldom in that awakened state when the mind is somehow aware of the reality of other times and other places. We are nearly always in a state of consciousness approximating the hypnotic trance. We are so seldom in the awakened state. Okay. If the 15th century is the century of magic, the 18th century is the least magical of all. Magic reached its lowest point and it three most noted practitioners, Cagliostro, St. Germain, and Casanova, were adventurers rather than occultists. To, conclude, to include Casanova among the magicians may cause surprise, but he was in fact a serious student of the Kabbalah and astrology, and although he thought of himself as an imposter, his powers of prophecy often surprised and worried him. His memoirs, besides being the world's greatest autobiography and the most complete picture of Europe in the 18th century, are also the best possible introduction to the forms taken by occultism in the Age of Reason. Giovanni Jacopo Casanova, who later added the spurious title Chevalier de Chengalt was born in Venice in April 1725, son of an actor of Spanish descent and the beautiful daughter of a shoemaker with whom he eloped. Young Giovanni was so sickly that he was not expected to live. A nosebleed continued so long that he was taken by his grandmother to a witch who locked him in a box while she performed noisy incantation. The bleeding stopped. The witch burned drugs, gathered the smoke, the smoke in a sheet, and wrapped, him, wrapped it around him. Finally, she told him that a beautiful lady would visit him that night. In the night, Casanova saw a beautiful fairy come out of the fireplace into his room. Fire grates were large in those days, and, and rubbed ointment on his head, speaking in a foreign language. His symptoms vanished during the next month, and he became a healthy and precocious boy. Before he, we dismiss this story as evidence of Casanova's fecund uh, uh, imagination, it is worth bearing in mind that, like Cellini, he often sounds less truthful than he actually is. Where it has been possible to check his stories against other sources, they have proved to be remarkably accurate. The witch was probably genuine, even if the fairy was a dream resulting from her suggestion or some psychedelics she burned and wrapped him in. In his teens, Casanova became an abbey, but his abbe, I guess, A-B-B-E, with a 
accent mark i don't know but his enthusiasm for the opposite sex was his downfall he was thrown out of the house of his patron a senator when he was caught with the senator's ward looking into the quote looking into the difference in con confirmation between a boy and a girl end quote after more similar indiscretions he left the church for the army then became a fiddler in a theater and joined a band of daredevils who spent their nights looking for trouble one evening he made the acquaintance of a senator named Brigadian, Bra Bragadine, Bragadine, yeah, who suffered an apo apo apoplectic fit. Wow, I must be getting tired. I can't read now. Apoplectic fit on the way home in a gondola. Casanova installed himself as a nurse. When the senator's two closest friends told Casanova he might go home if he wanted to, Casanova replied with his naturally theatrical instinct, quote, if I go, he will die. If I stay, he will get well, end quote. Strangely enough, the prophecy proved accurate. In the night, Bragadin almost succumbed to a mercury poultice that his physician had put on his chest. Casanova removed it and washed his chest, whereupon the invalid fell into a peaceful slumber. The following day, the doctor resigned the case and left his patient in the care charge of Casanova, who proceeded to quote medical authorities he had never read and prescribed the correct treatment, rest and diet, by instinct. A mercury poultice. That's the state of, med of uh, medicine at the time. Okay, I am going to... Um, I'm trying to find a good stopping point around these pictures. But it looks like Casanova goes on for some pages here. And I am not going to go much further. So, all right. Actually, I, I think I'll call that the uh, the the stopping point right there, um, where he cured his friend by instinct. These pictures are not related directly to the text in this part of the book. They're just where they stuck all the pictures for the entire book, just in one section. For whatever reason, I never understood why they did that in older books. They just went, they just get to about the halfway point and they go, ah, let's throw the pictures in there. <laughs> so I'm going to show you all of them just because why the hell not? And, um, and then we'll call it a session. So the first one, a stone age shaman. And I think, I don't know if this one is the one out of, um, Lasco cave or not. It doesn't actually say here. Oof, I'm going to take these glasses off. I don't need them for this. Okay. I don't know if that's the one out of Lasco Cave or not. Um, but a Stone Age magician. Um, or a Stone Age shaman, I think. I think the one in Lasco Cave is called the magician. But... Um, then we have Paracelsus, Nostradamus, Cellini, and John D. all on this page. So, Paracelsus. We've all seen this one of Nostradamus. John D. Oh, oh, wrong way. And... Cellini, who we haven't read, read about yet, only seen him mentioned. Then we have Casanova, Cagliostro, and Mesmer. So there we go. Casanova, 
Cagliostro, and Mesmer. So four 16th century magicians and three 18th century magicians, uh, occultists. Then people will be reading about in the future, plus one that we've already read about, Swedenberg. Um, David Dunglas Holm, who we've heard about a little bit so far. So David Dunglas Holm, right? Oh, right here. And then this is Swedenberg. Of course, that is H.P. Blavatsky. Three 19th century spiritualists. Then we come up here. That's Rasputin. He's going to be an interesting read. And of course, Aleister Crowley. Then we've got W.B. Yeats, Robert Gre Graves, Gurdjieff, and J.B. Bennett. So Yeats, um, Graves, Gurdjieff. I want to read some of his stuff too. And Bennett. And the last page, Harry Price and Bishop Pike. So, come on, focus. Oh, come on. I had it for a second. Anyway. Bishop Pike, Harry Price, Bishop Pike. The sec that bottom one is Bishop Pike. So that's it. That's all the pictures in the entire book. There might be some other illustrations here that I'm not seeing, but otherwise that's it. So that'll be it for tonight. I'll finish up that chapter next time, Tuesday. And uh, that'll be that. So... Um, uh, it's early enough. I'm going to play some Greedfall, so I will end this, refresh my drink, and uh, I'll be back in just a little bit. See you then.
Yeah.